Okay, are we visible? Let me ask. Are we visible? Okay, well, I'm gonna assume we're visible for right now until we find out that we are not. Uh, but right. it says this video is private, so we're gonna find out in a moment. <clears throat> the very fun part of what? It says we were we, live. We are visible. We're visible. I, I, yes. Yeah, I, I just logged hey. into our YouTube channel. Oh, thank God. Oh, we are live. Hey, what's up? <laughs> People are like, <laughs> what is happening? <laughs> uh, okay, hello, everyone. This is welcome to the weekly entertainment um, and uh, reflection of grad school, grad chat. But uh, thanks thanks for coming again to, to grad chat where we talk about difficult conversations, um, kind of the things in grad school, in academia that maybe we don't talk about it as much, but we definitely should. Uh, my name is Susanna Harris, and I'm going to kick it over to my amazing co-host, Fay Lin. Welcome to Grad Chat, everyone. My name is Fay Lin, and today's topic is incentive structures in academia. Our guest today is Dr. Rob Brown, who is a postdoc at UCLA in computational genetics and medicine. And I was honored to meet Rob in person as a fellow UCLA person, I think last year at the Quantitative and Computational Biosciences Retreat, where we connected over these topics of mentorship, mental health, and incentive structures. And I saw Rob not only emphasize these topics with students, but also engage faculty in these discussions, which was absolutely amazing. So I'm so excited to talk to Rob today in today's grad chat. So Rob, if you want to share a little bit more about maybe some of the roles outside of research that you've been doing in, in mentorship and these other important topics in academia, and also if you wanna say why you're interested in talking about incentive structures today. Yeah, totally. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for having me, having me on here and for, for getting this all set up. Uh, the first rule about PhDs is everything takes about 10 to 15 times longer than you expect it to. So sorry, sorry about the technical difficulties, all those who, uh, who tuned in on time. Okay. But uh, <laughs> yeah, so um, as Phelan mentioned earlier here, we actually met at the QC Bio Retreat, which is a very good retreat if you don't go. But um, another thing QC Bio does, which possibly unbeknownst to QC Bio is to prompt for a lot of my work in the past few years is they have this summer program called Big Summer, which I have the, the shirt from it last year. In theory, there's a shirt this year too, but I'll get that later. Um, but it's this summer program where they bring in these undergraduates. Um, they try to get them from um, individuals who are underrepresented minorities in the program. And we we bring them into our labs for about eight weeks and we basically give them a research project and mentor them. And it's just really great experience for them. A lot of them end up coming to UCLA. So I think it's a really good way of kind of breaking down barriers for individuals who wouldn't normally consider um, these PhD programs to actually get them excited and applying. Um, and it's something you should all check out. It's, it's a great way to, to, to actually have a, a means of increasing diversity in your programs. But during the first week, the first time I did it, I think I've done it like three times now, but during the first week, you know, I had these undergraduates who basically knew nothing about computational genetics. And I kind of gave this some, this like one week crash course in everything they were gonna need to know. I, you know, I taught them about genetics. I taught them how we formatted files, how we read the files. Like it was this huge ordeal. And it was like my entire week. And I just remember sitting there and being like, I am never doing this again. It's an entire week of my life just like gone. And then luckily I only thought that for like a minute or two. And then I'm like, oh wait, there's actually a huge opportunity here because these are definitely not the only people who need to learn about computational genetics. And in fact, I needed to learn about it. I came in with a physics background and I think I had taken like one-ish biology course in my entire life, I definitely skipped it in high school so I thought it was a worthless science at the time. And, uh, you know, so that that was my background coming in. And I remember my entire first year of grad school, I, I was trying to figure out the difference between like a chromosome and a haplotype. 
pretty much thinking they were the same thing. Just like so many problems with how I actually thought about the field. And then I'm just like, there's, we don't actually have ways of onboarding people and bringing people who don't have backgrounds into our field. There's no efficient way to do it. We don't really have good coursework for it. And so from that, I said, okay, I'm never doing this again. And by that, I meant, you know, spending a week of my life doing it. So instead, I spent months of my life um, trying to put together training videos and a framework so that if somebody wanted to enter our field or say some undergraduate wanted to say, hey, I want to do research. I'm like, awesome. Watch these 10 hours of videos and come back and see me because you'll know now what we do as a field and I won't have invested 10 hours in you and you won't now feel obligated to actually do this research if you don't actually like it. And so I was trying to create like a, a better, more fluid marketplace for getting people involved, but also so that anybody could watch it from any background. So if you don't have that strong Gen X background, but think you might want to apply to the program, you could watch the videos and be like, oh, this is actually something I'm interested in. Let me learn more. But the, the reason I swinging back to incentive structures and why I want to talk about that is um, as I was making these videos, I found uh, three other people who were like super, yeah, let's do this. Uh, Alex Chu, Brandon Ju, and uh, Samantha Jensen. Awesome people, you should look them all up. And the four of us were like, let's do this. And then I don't wanna say it was pulling teeth to get anybody else involved, but it was really hard. And, and I thought a lot about this because everybody loved the idea. Faculty loved the idea, other students loved the idea. Everybody saw the benefit but it was really hard to get other people to say, okay, I'll make a 20 minute module and put some slides together and video record it and we'll post it. And so, um, so I thought a lot about that and also other projects I've been involved in throughout grad school and why it is we have so many people who are, are really supportive of the work that we want to do, yet aren't, I don't want to say they're not willing, but aren't able for some reason to actually Help out. And I'm sure the two of you have seen this as well, especially in, in the different activism that you're involved in. Um, for instance, talking about mental health with faculty, every faculty I'm sure actually wants us to have good mental health and yet getting any changes implemented is just, you know, you just can't do it. Do you, is that something you guys have noticed as well or what's, Oh, absolutely. Um, so on the PhD balance team, we're really lucky to have two current um, lecturers, faculty members. Um, and so they are very outspoken about it. But one of the interesting things that I found when I was doing a lot of, you know, in person talking where I was talking at universities and got to have little one on one meetings with professors, a lot of them would say this is such an important thing. I remember in grad school when I really struggled and I saw a therapist and I took medication and I still see a therapist. And I'm like, that's great. You know, how have you talked about that with your with your groups? And they're like, oh, no, no, no. I mean, I'm not in a good position to do that. Like I'm not at the, I'm either I'm not tenured or I'm, you know, I'm still trying to get grants or I don't want people to be nervous. Um, and that was just the side of like being nervous. But then on the other side, as far as incentive structure, they were underwater in so many other, other ways that like they, they were trying to look at it and say, how can I spend time donating my time to this when there's all this pressure to do all these other things? Totally. Yeah, and, and you kind of mentioned something that I also think a lot about. Because like talking to all of my friends and just like watching PIs through time, because I've been at UCLA for a decade now, and watching young PIs come in, super motivated to be incredible mentors. And then I don't want to say that they like fall apart in mentorship like two to three years later, but you can definitely see as they get more responsibilities, their ability to actually devote time to their students into doing good mentorship decreases dramatically. And, and I've seen people really upset about this. Uh, their grad students and postdocs become very upset about this. Others kind of are okay with it. But, but in my mind, it's always like, why? Why does that happen? Because these aren't people who don't want to be good mentors. They really do. And if you ever say you have an issue, they like make time for you and they're there. And so why is it we have so many people with so many good intentions unable to follow through on anything? And 
for me, my answer to all of this has always come down to incentive structures. It's we get rewarded for certain things and the things we don't get rewarded for, we're not able to put time into. And for faculty, it's extremely hard. Like they have to get grant funding to pay us and they have to get papers published to get tenure. And, and unless they're doing that, and then they have all these committees they have to serve on, like they have all these things that they have to do that they're actually rewarded for. And then all the things they're not rewarded for like initiatives to increase diversity, going to a mentorship training course, like all of those, I like they never come up as actual, they're not requirements, they're not things that they're held accountable for. And like, I know in my life, like the, the things that I'm not held accountable for slip by the wayside and mm -hmm. it's really easy. And so on the one hand, like you want to blame mentors for this and on the other hand, don't think the blame is actually with the mentors. It's it's with these structures that we have that we've inherited. And over time, we've just said, well, this is how it is. And we, you know, we, we can't change things, but because that it's always an uphill struggle. And like PhD Balance has this issue and in its initiatives, you have these initiatives with diversity, you have them with creating any sort of equity is it's that we might have these really lofty goals, but we never realign our incentive structures. And what we should really do is forget about our goals. Who cares about goals? Let's set the incentive structures so it'll achieve what we want. Like mm -hmm. as a geneticist, you know, natural selection's a thing. You could probably go into every cell and CRISPR for a certain, you know, variant you wanted, or you can just kind of like, you know, figure out some selection screen and mm -hmm. shove them through until you then get what you want. And that selection screen is our incentive structures. Like we yeah. don't actually have to push things if we're able to create an incentive structure, which will pull it the way we want. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And just, I mean, I know that some people can get weird about wanting to think about like incentive structures or, you know, rewarding people. I, people too often I hear, well, you shouldn't have to reward people for doing good things. Right. Um, but I think, on the flip side, like you get punished for not doing other things and, and you get yes. chastised and it's like, we do, we have an incentive structure in place, right? But it's, but what are the goals and what are those selection uh, processes, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah, let's see, I, did I write it in my notes here? Cause one of the polls that I did asked yeah. about uh, uh, public outreach in broader, um, broader impacts from grants. I don't think it's here, but th there's, and it's nice because people are starting to like make these changes and recognizing that changes need to go for grants now. Um, you have to have broader impact sections. Like what's this gonna do besides this research? Is it gonna, you know, are you gonna train some undergraduates? Are you gonna do some public outreach? And, and I think that's really important because we're starting to realize that you know, the, those are the, the first hinges of changing the incentive structure around things, but they're not really followed up on to the best of my knowledge. Most people didn't even know what the broader impacts were on the grants they worked on. Yep. And most people didn't say that they were ever like motivated to do public outreach. And I'd be fascinated to know the breakdown by like department, like do the humanities do more public outreach than the sciences do or vice versa. Mm -hmm. I'm sure that's very heterogeneous there, but but talking kind of back to your point about reward structure and that we're not supposed to reward people for certain things, I I think that's totally true. Like we shouldn't like you shouldn't reward me for saying we should have diversity because like yeah obviously we should, but but what you could reward me for is saying hey we're now going to make a part of faculty selection for who we hire looking at people who have a strong public outreach component on their CV. Mm -hmm. And the reason public outreach is important is because, uh, how, how does it go? If you can't see something, you can't be something, hmm. or that there's some phrase like that. Yeah. And again, this is what Big Summer does really well, is they get these people who wouldn't normally see these research fields as options for them, and it shows them that they are. And so if you just start saying, okay, public outreach is now a like a requirement on a grant, like you have to do this many hours of public grant if you want this grant to be renewed. 
and you have to like document it and show it and do it. Now all of a sudden people are going to do that public outreach. It's going to expose the field to individuals who might not see it otherwise. And, and that's something that will, you know, incentivize those goals. So you're not rewarding me for, you know, trying to make diversity, but you're rewarding me for, I did something besides publish a paper. And yeah. And I think that needs to happen. Um, and in some rewards are, some rewards are requirements. So for instance, I was talking to Alex Hoffman at QC Bio, who I actually need to follow up on about this, but one of my favorite easy to implement changes that I've heard about recently, it's the lab welcome letter. And it's this idea that when you look to join a lab, um, say in the future, I wanna join Phelan's lab and I look and she's like, oh, you want to join my lab? All right, here's our lab welcome letter. And you can see, oh, I this is how much I expect people to be in lab. If you want to take a vacation, here's how you do it. Um, mm -hmm. If you have like family issues or monetary issues, like I expect you to come to me so we can, you know, figure out an arrangement with you for how you can take the time you need. And, and it's, you know, just clearly lay out what the expectations are in the lab. So we're not in this nebulous, like, oh, does everybody work all the time? because that's the default unless you actually kind of set a hard stop. And I would love if every PI at UCLA and all schools were just required to have this for their lab. And I don't, in getting that required across UCLA, like I don't think there's a chance of doing it, mm. but, but you could talk to Alex Hoffman and be like, oh, you wanna be a part of QC Bio? Well, one of the requirements now for PIs to join QC bios, they have to have a lab welcome letter. And it's just like a little thing you could do that will, you know, it'll force the PI to sit down for a few hours and actually make this document, which I think would have huge impact on, on lab culture and expectations and work-life balance. And, and so even though people aren't really incentivized to have it now, I mean, they should be. They totally should be, but you know, they have a grant to write. So they'll do it after writing the grant and then after writing that paper and after reviewing this, like, I, I think that trying to figure out, yeah, requirements can be incentives. You want to, you want to be a part, here's something that we think would be really important to go in. And uh, this is something where I should actually follow up with him and be like, we, we need to figure out a way to do this. And the, um, is actually a really good, I think it was in nature. They actually had a template that they put out and read a whole little paper about it and why it's a good thing. And I wish that would be important, but um, there's that. And the other thing is uh, UCLA has this mentoring class, which I think is really, really good. Hmm. And I took it about a year ago now, I think it's the fall last year, but it was all young faculty, like super young faculty. And our joke was all the faculty who need to be here aren't here. And, mm -hmm. and it's kind of an unfortunate like thing. It's like the people who really care about making these improvements probably aren't the people who need to sit down in a class and actually like watch this. And, and as like, I, again, I would, I would love to be like, dear faculty, if you, if you want something, you have to take a mentoring class. Like, how how it's not required for faculty to make mentoring classes in order to actually like move in their career like you can't get tenure without taking like five mentoring classes across your you know years getting up to there like it would be such an easy requirement and it would be so beneficial for the entire community and mm -hmm. and people would be very incentivized to take a mentoring class if they couldn't get tenure without it like yep it would be there. And so the, the question is like, how, how can we do this? How can we, how can we get these little changes made that will have huge impact across the, across the community? Yeah, yeah. no, I love how you're bringing together all of these different ways in which we can change our incentive structure systems already to prioritize these goals. And, and for our grad chats, we usually have our, I guess, to our a PhD Balance Instagram takeover on Friday, on Fridays. And I remember you said something that really resonated with me about incentive structures. And it was like, it's one thing to make goals, 
But if you're not putting in the incentive structures to reach those goals, then you're making it a big battle to even achieve those, those goals. Incentive structures mm -hmm. really are such a key component in however you want to get to the goals that you want to reach. And I think this is such an important topic because like you said in the beginning, we often say, oh, well, this mentor was a poor mentor because of this way, but then really shifting this discussion to, well, let's look at the system. There's no really a way for, for mentors to be incentivized to be better and kind of shifting our framing from the individual to an overall system. And totally. let's see, we, yeah, and we have some questions here that I do want to get to. So yeah, go for it. <laughs> so Rob, what, one of the questions here we have, what do you think are the strongest incentive structures in academia and what are their effects? And if you want to talk a bit more about some of your initiatives and your ideas on how to change incentive structures to reach these goals. Yeah, totally. Um, so I think that the, the strongest incentive structures, like we, we kind of have a very top down approach in academia. And so our incentive structures as graduate students or postdocs largely come from our incentive structures of the PIs who oversee us. Because, you know, when we're young and don't really know what we're doing, they kind of tell us what to do. They, they tell us what the rewards are and they, they very much tell us what their rewards are, which like they need papers getting published because if they don't get papers, they're not getting grant funding. If they're not getting grant funding, they don't have a lab. And so we have very much become a part of that system and that becomes our incentive as well. And so the, and this is a good and bad thing. It's a good thing because we are in fact in grad school to become researchers and a PhD is a research degree. And so we do in fact need to conduct research. That is, that is our number one priority when we are in grad school. Mm -hmm. and, and so it's good that we have those incentives to, to motivate us to do our research. The problem I see is that over time, I think that those incentive structures have dominated to an extent that there aren't really incentives to ever do anything else. And and I'm also also really talking from my background here as somebody who went through like a STEM PhD program. Mm -hmm. Um, I've got to believe that like if you're in the social sciences or humanities where when you go on to be faculty, you're going to do a, have a much higher teaching load than you might if you're like a research PI that there they probably incentivize teaching and mentoring a little bit more than they do here, especially because like I know for people in the humanities, a lot of their funding is through TAing and like in my program, we had to TA once. And so there, there, there are differences. So I'm very much talking from my background here and the incentive structures I've noticed. But um, so on the one, that's probably the strongest. But what I think is really interesting and that I've also noticed is that while we're incentivized to do publishing and research, we're also highly incentivized to be creative. And we're incentivized mm -hmm. to have new ideas. And I think that's oftentimes overlooked. For instance, I've, I've had a lot of, kind of crazy ideas throughout my PhD career in post -docking. And I've always found my PIs to be very supportive of those crazy ideas. Mm -hmm. And that's really cool. Like we are actually in an environment where you get rewarded for thinking outside of the box and mm -hmm. for looking at systems and be like, ah, I don't like this system. Like, how can we change? How can we manipulate it? How can we, how can we make it better? And so I've gotten a lot of support to kind of follow these things. And the problem is not in, I don't think the problems in necessarily having these ideas and wanting change, but it all comes back to, I now need to find people who are willing to work on these with me. Cause if you want to make systemic change, you can't do it by yourself. Mm -hmm. And again, as I said, with, with, uh, with big bio, like we had four key people. And then after that I found probably like four or five other people who, who thought it was really important. And I'm so appreciative of them because they actually made the time and took the time out of their schedule and their research to go and make modules for us. And they've made some really good modules and I'm super appreciative of their efforts, but we kind of had this dream when we were doing big bio because 
the uh, the whole software for the website. We we're, we're trying to make it all open source, so anybody from any academic field can like download it and be like, "Cool, we'll do it now too." And just like it just doesn't roll because as graduate students, we're not incentivized to jump onto cool initiatives like. Mm -hmm that number one incentive of you got to get your papers done keeps us from saying, oh, well, maybe you should 80% time or 90% time work on your papers, but 10% time you should help in this program that will make our community stronger for everybody and ultimately a much more efficient and more productive community. But nobody can take that time individually to do that because, because there's no obvious reward for it. Like, yeah. it's not clear that you'll get a postdoc position because you made a big bio module. It's not clear that you will, you know, get tenure because you took on four undergraduates for big summer. Like, they're, those aren't there. So, so while people might really want to help, they're not actually, they don't necessarily have the time because they have to do the things that will actually help them in their careers. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think both Faye and I resonate with that in terms of uh, a lot of my work at the end. Uh, and look, I had, luckily I had this, I had a committee that totally understood my career path um, because they said, well, what do you want to do? It was probably a couple of years before I graduated. And I said, I want to go into science communication and I really care about this grad student outreach. And they're like, cool, let's get you the minimum paper requirement and get you out. Um, and they really, really supported me in doing that. But it was very confusing to some other professors. And then even now that I've graduated, um, there is, there's still effort in some ways to try to leverage, well, you should get paper. Don't you want to get papers? Like you need to work on this. And I've had to come back and say, I really, I really don't care about this paper. I really care a lot about other things, but I care about other authors on the paper. And so for them, I will put in this time. And I think that's, again, you can use different incentive structures, but also understanding that the incentive structures we're used to, you know, that that might not actually incentivize most people, right? Like you have to think creatively. And I love that you bring up that incentivizing creativity is something we already kind of do. How can we use that and, and kind of propel these other initiatives? Oh, totally. And um, so one of the other things I wanted to mention is like most people don't go on to be PIs and most people don't go into be faculty. And as I was preparing for this interview, I thought to some of my friends and the different routes that they've taken. And um, uh, one of my old lab mates, Malika, she wants to go into genetic counseling. So I think for like the last two years, she got very, very involved in like the, I have no idea what the group's called. There's some group at UCLA interested in genetic counseling and she got involved with them and was like a leader there. And now she's implied to, to um, get a degree license. I don't actually know what's required, but whatever you do to become a genetic counselor, she's now like going down that route. And um, other people are going into science advocacy and policy. Like there's so many of these creative ideas where people are super motivated and like, yes, let's give them the freedom to like run with what they care about as opposed to try to like badger them to get papers. And, and I think that, I think a lot of PIs are actually like an okay with this you know you have to figure out how to do it and you have to negotiate like boundaries and how it will go down but I, I think we're getting to the point where where a lot of people in academia are realizing that I'm not necessarily training a new PI I might be training someone who tangentially will be rated to the field and and they can figure out how to do that um, one of the incentive structures I didn't actually mention that I also think is super important is, um, well, papers and grants are important. Like, it's really important to be, like, famous on Twitter now, in our field at least. Like, there are people who tweet a lot in interesting things. It's how our field communicates, for better or worse. And people also, people like to be well-known in this field. And, and, and I think it's a good thing. So, for instance... At UCLA, there's this thing called CGSI, the Computational Genetics Summer Institute. It started a few years ago. It's an outstanding program. And they bring faculty from all over. And they're all at UCLA. Lots of students come. They learn a lot. And it's a fantastic networking event. You get to learn people from all over the field. And it was great for UCLA because now they're this like center hub of genetics. 
And so, you know, the PI is here, like it helps them become more important in the field. And so in addition to getting papers, is this like, you know, let's, let's, let's be known. And I think that, and one of the reasons I think I also got support for Big Bio is like, I've seen it show up in grants now because they're like, oh, this is our broader impacts. This is actually what we can do and say, hey, now we're reaching further into the field, we're doing more. And so I think there really is space for people to do non, you know, to do the minimum number of papers required if that now opens up a new avenue where you can still strengthen the program at the school. You can still have your PI look good. It's not like you're a failed grad student if you wanna go into genetic counseling instead of genetic research. And, and I think that those are really good conversations that we need to figure out a way to incentivize graduate students to have with their PIs like a few years in be like, all right, you now know about the field, you know what's going on, like where are you going? And how can we get there in a way that is mutually beneficial to all of us? Yeah, no, I think this is, this is such a great point about how our incentive structures are really narrow in the sense that they incentivize a research career. And not mm -hmm. everyone wants to go into academia or be a PI. And if anything, I think during these COVID times, we've seen that it's really important to have scientists in all areas of society outside of research, if that's science communication, if that's outreach. And one of the hard parts about graduate education is these incentive structures that don't support people going outside of academia at the end of the day. So I think that's, that's such an important point that I know personally as someone interested in science communication and outreach, like Susanna was saying, I, I have a, I guess, similar path where I'm thankful that I have supportive people who are championing me in this path, but that's not always the case because of our incentive structures in place. Um, yeah, so, and so like, I wanna make sure that we leave a, a couple minutes because I know you do a ton of different stuff. Um, first of all, like, are you comfortable with people reaching out to you? Um, you know, you have your handle there. Are you comfortable with people reaching out to you afterwards and asking questions, sending, you know, inquiries? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, awesome. I guess Twitter is how we communicate now. So uh, yeah, yeah that, that's my Twitter handle down at the bottom. And yeah, tweet at me, direct message me, whatever you'd like, definitely. That's awesome. And, you know, is there anything else that you want to highlight or, you know, say to the folks that are watching? There's some pretty interesting <laughs> chats going on. A lot of people are really resonating with what you're saying about like, incentivizing based on the person, but I know you're involved in a bunch of other uh, activities as well. Yeah, so the the one thing I kind of want to touch on is a project that I've, which I've bar barely started at this point, like, I basically drew something on a piece of paper, and uh, that's as far as it's gone. But um, I relate, so sometimes you're not going to be able to get past your incentive structures, you're not going to be able to realign them but you, you have something you're passionate about. For instance, mental health is a great example um, because with Twitter, you both of you have been able to create this space where people have been able to share about their mental health. And it used to be that there were all these, like let's, from the economics, let's call them barriers to entry. Like the barriers to entry to talking publicly about mental health is that there wasn't a space for it. You didn't do it in lab, you didn't use your PI, where would it happen? But with Twitter now it's like, oh, oh, you can do it, other people are doing it. Yeah, let's all do it. And, and even when all of the incentives are aligned against you, one of the ways to try to swim against that current is by figuring out ways that you personally can reduce a barrier to entry so you can kind of like tow somebody else along. And one of the things that I've been thinking about um, since the whole Black Lives Matter movement really started is like what I can do personally to make a difference. And, and I come from a position of like, I'm not a PI, I'm not a Dean. Like I can tell PIs what I think they should do. And I do that all the time, but I don't, uh, I don't actually have that power. So it's like, what can I personally do now? And so I've kind of taken that idea of, you know, if kind of like that, what big summer does, if you, if you can't see yourself, 
in a position, then you're not gonna be in that position ever. And so I'm like, all right, if we wanna get underrepresented minorities into our programs and really like create that diversity that doesn't exist right now, like what am I supposed to do? And you know, you can look at your applicant pool and be like, okay, well, we had no underrepresented minorities apply. So what are we supposed to do? Like, and that's not a good answer. Like, mm -hmm. and I think the answer really is just public outreach and say, okay, well, you know, what about freshman courses where those people are kind of deciding where they're going to go down? How do you outreach to them? Or for me, like, how do you get into high schools? How do you get into high schools and say, hey, look, there's these cool fields, you should do it too. And what I've realized is that I think a lot of people would love to, to get into high schools and go to Skype a scientist and be like, hey, genetics, look, there are women in genetics too. And also in computer science and everywhere. But but like it's a lot of effort and a lot of people have never had that experience. So what I am thinking about doing right now is actually creating like this whole lesson plan that basically anyone can steal from me. And it would start a little bit like big bio where there's gonna be like probably an hour worth of videos that actually teaches a lot of genetics, like the genetics you'll need for when I actually come visit that classroom. And, um, you know, they'll, they'll teach you about like genotypes and haplotypes and complex diseases. But then when I get into that classroom, they've now already learned about genetics. We're really doing that flipped classroom thing. Mm -hmm. And then I have this cool, I'm gonna call it a simulation, but basically it's a piece of paper where they have like their parents and they inherit different variants for their parents and every variant has like a height effect size. And they get to like see how, you know, inheriting different variants like changes their height. And then, um, Anyways, it kind of goes through that. And then they learn about like, oh, and now there's this distribution of height that we see in the population. And the reason I like this is because in the, that first hour of video, I want to get a bunch of my friends that shows a very like diverse cross section of the people in the field. So that when people watch these videos, it's like, all right, it's not just, you know, white Rob sitting here as this white male, like, oh, oh here's a woman. Here's like this person and that person. So they can actually see a lot of different people in the field. And then most importantly, that game would be like really easy to do from the standpoint of like when you actually Skype in. So like if you wanted to do it, you can kind of read the directions and be like, okay, this is how we walk through it. These are the videos they've already sun. So when you then want to go into that classroom, it would be very easy for you to do it. Because I think a lot of people would be willing to do it if they didn't have to come up with an entire lesson plan by themselves. Because like, that's, that's a lot of work. You want to do a one hour lesson, you're, you're probably putting in like seven or eight hours easy. And then do you even know if it's going to be good or not? So that's what I want to do is I kind of want to like work through this lesson plan of like, this is how you could go teach in this school. And all you have to invest is like 30 minutes plus the time to actually go into the school. I love that. So that would reduce this barrier to entry because the barrier is you have to get your research done. But if we can like make it so we don't cut too much into that, then it might be easier for, for people to go in. So, so if you want to be involved with that, uh, you know, send me a message on Twitter. But I, that, that's kind of my, my next thinking is something that, that I personally can do and hopefully get other people involved in doing as well as figuring out how do, we, how do we make public outreach something that isn't as big of a commitment as it currently is right now. Because if we can do that, I think we can eventually reach out to more people and, and hopefully no longer have underrepresented minorities in our programs. Because yeah. We can actually get people represented pretty well. That's awesome. You're doing so many, so many amazing things. And we're all pretty much out of time for our grad chat, but it was fantastic talking to you, Rob, and hearing about all of these amazing initiatives that you're doing. I think people watching also got more ideas about how they can change their incentive structures at their own campus or local environment. So we got to wrap up, but if you're watching now, this is Grad Chat. <laughs> we go live every Saturday, 12 p.m. Pacific, 3 p.m. Eastern, and we bring on different guests from various, mostly grad students, but also bring on various people in different areas of their careers where we talk about interesting topics, and today was incentive structures. If you liked what you saw today, join us again next week. Saturday. Thanks so much again, Rob. No, you're very well. Thank you so much for having me. It was a, it was a pleasure being here.